welcome to this morning's Grand Rounds. Uh, it's really a, an honor and a privilege uh, for me to introduce our speaker for this morning, Dr. Francois Dagenet, uh, who's been a cardiac surgeon at the uh, Institut de Cardiologie et Pneumologie de Québec for close to 25 years, I would say now. Uh, Francois and I go back a long way, so for those who know who don't know him that well, I will just uh, go back a little bit on his background. Francois did his, uh, went to medical school and did his uh, general surgery and then cardiac surgery training at Université de Montréal. And uh, I had a chance to meet him when I was a PGY1 and he was my senior resident in cardiac surgery. And we had like an instant connection and we've since had a very long standing uh, uh, professional collaboration, but also, and most importantly, uh, long standing friendship. Uh, Francois then went on to Stanford for his fellowship, where he specialized in uh, aortic surgery work with uh, Craig Miller and uh, heart transplant. So then when he came back to Quebec, uh, Quebec was a very high volume center, arguably probably the, the one, the, the center in cardiac surgery with the highest volume, but academia was pretty much inexistent and Francois really transformed the place when he came back. Um, he started research uh, uh, there, uh, uh, built a very strong research team. Uh, he did his original trials, but also uh, participated in, uh, in multi-center trials. He was uh, P local PI for more than 30 trials over time, and he's got like uh, more than 300 uh, peer-reviewed papers. Uh, now, he, uh, there was also the, the center also didn't have a residency program, and Francois was... Uh, uh, leader in establishing a residency program in Quebec, which is uh, uh, now functioning very well. Uh, so we're very proud of that. And uh, on the uh, clinical side, well, he pioneered the minimally invasive surgery uh, field in Quebec. Uh, he developed the aortic clinic, which is also uh, uh, very well functioning. And um, he established collaborations across the country with uh, several aortic surgeons. Uh, people know him for coming up to help on in the difficult aortic cases across the country. And he also developed his, uh, his own uh, graph that he will be discussing about, for which the first human implant was done about two weeks ago. So uh, it's, um, uh, I think we're a bit lucky. This is some sort of an avant-première because Francois will, uh, uh, his, his tremendous uh, contribution to the field of cardiac surgery will be celebrated at the upcoming CCC in Vancouver where he will be receiving the Lifelong Achievement Award from the CSCS. So uh, I'm very happy and we're glad to welcome Francois to give us a talk about uh, aortic dissection and uh, mild perfusion. There's a couple of housekeeping notes that I was asked to uh, go through. Uh, if you want to ask questions for those who are attending virtually, you can use the Q&A uh, feature and there's also the uh, hand up feature that you can use at the end. For those in the room, <clears throat> I will ask you to go to the mic, the standing mic that's close to the uh, to the computer there. If you have questions to ask Francois after the uh, after his presentation, so Francois. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pierre. It's an honor to be here and to present in your prestigious uh, institution. It's an honor also to be invited by Pierre. Uh, Pierre and I, as he said, uh, go back very far and, uh, you know, you stole Pierre from me, you stole my colleague, and, but I think you start to know that uh, he has tremendous qualities in terms of leadership, in terms of uh, quality of surgery, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, judgment, uh, in terms of humanity, in terms of humility, and uh, I miss that, and, uh, but I keep a tremendous friendship that will be lifelong. So I'm not here to make you cry. I'm here to make you talk about aorta. So uh, I hope you'll find this. If you're here for, um, for a randomized trial, you're not at the right the venue because here you'll have a lot of cases. You'll have a dynamic talk and uh, I hope you'll enjoy. So sit back, relax and enjoy. So these are my disclosures. Just to start, this is an eye opener, okay? So if you warm the room a bit, this is a 32 year old uh, woman who just gave, gave birth to her first fourth child uh, from C-section. Two days later, she has abdominal pain. They do an echo and they, uh, they see a flap. So they do a thoracic CT. And you can see that she has a, a type A dissection. Uh, all the CTs are gonna be like this. You'll see the CT and I, I, I 
point out the, the problematic. So she has an included the left carotid. She has a right aberrant subclavian that's dissected, small true lumen, and she has almost no true lumen in the abdomen. So this is the kind of cases we're going to discuss today and see how to, to deal with these cases. And she's going to come back and haunt us a few times during my presentation. Okay. So what we'll try to do, we'll try to review the pathophysiology and the clinical presentation of malperfusion during aortic dissection. Uh, we'll establish a comprehensive treatment uh, based on the literature, but by, based also on my experience and also discuss the indication of new therapies that we have available in our tool set. <clears throat> so just to make sure that we all start with the same knowledge, uh, aortic dissection, as you know, has two classifications. You have the Stanford classification and you have the, the, the Bakey classification. So type A dissection is a flap in the ascending aorta. Type B at the Stanford classification is this dissection distal to the left subclavian. And this really dichotomized a surgical treatment for type A, medical treatment for type B at that time. So in the Debakey classification, we just changed for the type A uh, uh, dissection that is in class one that is the most frequent. Type two is the less frequent uh, type A dissection. And, and as you know, uh, Michael Debakey, I think, is the uh, elder, the oldest survival of a, of a type two dissection at 80, 98 years old, uh, and which is uh, quite a feat to, to survive his own classification. Okay, now this is maybe one of the most important slides is, is who are the actors in, in, in dissection. So you have to understand that when, some, when the, the, the initiation of the dissection comes from a, a tear in, in the intima. So that's where we have the primary intimal tear. That's usually the largest tear. And what happens is the blood dissects through the media and pushes the septum. The adventitia is stronger than the septum. So the septum is pushed uh, depending on the pressure uh, uh, in the uh, false lumen. And at that time, the false lumen protrudes in the true lumen and that's where you can have distal reentries. So it's important to understand uh, the relationship of the primary intermal tear and the distal reentries. And we'll discuss about that uh, in the upcoming slides. The other communication between the true and the false lumen come from the shearing of the branch vessels on the aorta. And that's what we call the natural fenestration. And that's what you see under TE when you have intercostal arteries that are sheared uh, in the descending aorta. So one thing that's very important to understand is what determines the position of the septum in an aortic dissection. And it's pretty easy when you think about it, and it's an important concept to understand malperfusion, it's the size of the primary intimal tear and the size and number of the distal reentries. So basically, if you have a large primary intimal tear with no to minimal reentries, you're gonna have high pressure in the false lumen, septum is gonna be pushed and gonna occlude the true lumen. And that's very important to, uh, to understand because most malperfusion syndromes are due to this uh, mechanism of uh, uh, dynamic malperfusion due, owing to a very high uh, 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 pressure in the false lumen, pushing the septum and obstructing the branch vessel of the aorta. So this is responsible for over 80% of cases of malperfusion. And you have to really think of that mechanism as the first uh, uh, mechanism that is implicated in malperfusion syndromes. The other mechanism is when the dissection goes in a branch vessel, causes intimal tear or a, a hematoma in the, in the, uh, our, uh, the branch vessel wall, and then you have a static malperfusion that won't be uh, solved if you reperfuse the true lumen. So these are uh, tricky dissections that we'll discuss a bit later on. Are malperfusion syndromes frequent, the frequent during type A dissection? Well, it's, it, it's about 20 to 30% of type A one dissection that present with malperfusion. And as you know, malperfusion syndromes are a very high uh, predictor of mortality uh, during uh, type one dissection. Okay, so how do you define a malperfusion syndrome? So basically it's pretty straightforward. It's the loss of blood supply in a vital organ caused by an arterial branch that's occluded as we just discussed. 
In the literature, you see that it should be a clinical diagnosis and you have symptoms such as stroke, paraplegia, abdominal pain, limb ischemia, depending on the branch vessel occlusion. Okay, but in my mind, imaging is also very informative. And why so? Well, some malperfusion are just diagnosed uh, on CT. You have here a, a kidney malperfusion uh, that you wouldn't see clinically if you didn't have an imaging. And the other impacts is that clinical symptoms are not always present with malperfusion. About 40% of patients with uh, uh, malperfusion, uh, uh, mesenteric ischemia, only have uh, abdominal pain. So if you have a patient that has combined malperfusion and has, uh, is comatose or is, is intubated, you won't see the malperfusion syndrome. You won't be, ab be able to evaluate the, the patient. The other aspect is what's the time between the CT and a, the a, event. So if the CT is very close to, uh, to the uh, event of dissection, well, then if you have a normal occlusion of the true lumen, watch yourself for distal malperfusion because it's probably just in, in being a, a installed and you'll have pe people that are gonna have gut ischemia. And another important aspect of fine on imaging is how does, how is the, uh, the septum moving at the uh, level of the hiatus? Here you have a, a, an image like this is only two, Im two images between these two uh, uh, still photos. So you have uh, the septum that's really compressed and almost just if you go down one or two image on the CT of one millimeter cuts, you see the septum that's uh, pushed uh, against the false lumen. So that is what I call fluttering of the septum. If you have that, that means there's a difference in pressure in the false lumen in the abdomen onto reentries compared to the thoracic aorta. And this usually signs that it's reassuring, showing that you have reentries in the abdomen and probably this patient will not suffer from a distal malperfusion. So these are important aspects to look to in your imaging preoperatively. So now with uh, this in mind, we have all the same knowledge. So it's easy to be an aortic surgeon in type A dissection. So we can now tackle uh, each mal organ malperfusion. One thing that you have to understand is the best place for a patient with malperfusion syndrome and dissection is most of the time in the OR. Okay, even if sometimes, you know, the surgeon is a bit afraid of dealing with these pathologies, but the first aspect that you have to, to learn, and we've learned this when we sign our Hippocrates uh, 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 oath, is that we should not cause any harm to the patient. And unfortunately, we can do that when we cannulate the patient for type A dissection. And I want to stress this, that you can induce malperfusion with your cannulation strategy. Here's an example of a femoral cannulation. Before you start the pump, you see the true lumen. You start the pump and you look complete occlusion of the true lumen uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the actual cuts. What is that? You perfuse here preferentially the false lumen and you have collapse of the uh, true lumen. So, so that's why every time you start a dissection case, you start a perfusion, you have to look down in the descending aorta and make sure that you have a nice opening of your true lumen and to make sure you don't induce malperfusion because this can translate into cardiac malperfusion, into brain malperfusion. So look at your EKG, look at your nears, Look at your echo in the descending aorta when you start the pump, just to make sure that you have good true lumen perfusion. This malperfusion induced CPB is more particularly when you use, have, happens more in femoral cannulation, but also can happen in axillary cannulation, especially if you have dissection of the proximal uh, uh, subclavian. Okay, so this is a 45, let's, let's start now with uh, some cases and we'll deal uh, one case after the other. This is a 45 year old patient. Uh, somebody looks at an EKG in the ER and sees an anterior leads uh, uh, infarct and uh, sends him to the cath lab. Here, I just want to make a plea. If you have a patient, I know the dissections are, are much rarer than, than a, a myocardial infarct, but if you have a young patient with a, a chest pain, 
question the patient on the chest pain, okay? Because patients that have dissections, they're gonna tell you the ripping pain. They're gonna tell you how the dissection evolves. You're gonna have the diagnosis. Question the patient, just don't look at the EKG. So this patient, you know, was looked at the, more at the EKG and was sent to the cath lab. And this is his uh, right coronary artery, okay? So it's a nice right coronary artery. But here you try to inject in, in the left main, there, there's nothing. And the patient becomes very unstable. Okay, and you do a, 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 an aerogram and you see a flap, but it's not very easy probably to see on your side. And the patient is transferred rapidly in the OR. And at that time, the patient is put on the table and when he's put on the table, he arrests, okay. So the sequence then is to do uh, cardiac massage and, and this patient was put on fem fem bypass uh, while the massage was done. Uh, patient was redraped uh, and the patient opened. And uh, at that time, what I like to do in those cases is I like to protect the heart with a bypass. So this patient had a, 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 a vein on the LAD and was uh, uh, protected during the, the operation by perfusion through the LAD and was able to be salvaged with, uh, with the surgery. So this patient uh, went on to have, uh, uh, unfortunately, a dilatation of his uh, proximal descending and uh, required a FET procedure later on. And you can see that the, 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 the LAD bypass was still patent, but you can look at the uh, the uh, the coronary angiogram uh, before his vet procedure, what you see a nice perfusion of the uh, uh, the left main, uh, probably owing to the uh, dynamic malperfusion that happened during his initial uh, uh, operation. Right coronary arteries are more involved than the left main, okay, and and it's important to learn that static malperfusion of the right coronary artery is more frequent, uh, and that for that issue, I really, if I had evidence of a right uh, coronary right of ventricle dysfunction, to put a, a vein early uh, during the operation to protect and to make sure that we have good RV perfusion at the end of the operation. This, now let's go to the brain, okay? This, this is a patient that uh, uh, shows occlusion of the uh, right common carotid. You see on the left at the picture and has left the uh, hemiparesis and has a, 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 a type one dissection, okay? So this patient was dealt, you know, with the early revascularization, the debranching of the arch vessels during cooling slow progressive reperfusion of the brain uh, and uh, was uh, uh, operated with a zone two. So a pretty rapid operation. So the subclavian was not uh, 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 revascularized uh, and this patient uh, uh, recuperated. He was about uh, four hours post uh, uh, chest pain and, and progressively recuperated from his left uh, hemiparesis. Uh, so this patient, as you can see, uh, had some uh, issues on the distal anastomosis with the uh, Dane, with the distal new entry, and had a TVAR completion uh, a couple of days later, and has a nice remodeling of the descending aorta. Okay. This is a, a, a bad case of a 38-year-old with a sudden chest pain and, and collapsed. Okay, and when you look at the CT, you see no tear in the ascending aorta. Okay, uh, and and what you can see, I'll try to put it back, is that you see this kind of uh, 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 interception of the intima in the arch, occluding the carotid arteries, and he has a right aberrant subclavian. Okay. So basically what happens, this is a circular dissection, but completely just was detached from the aorta and went with an interception in the, uh, the arch. So at this point, this patient was once again uh, operated with a, a, a early ar uh, 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 arch vessel debranching, the perfusion of the two car carotid arteries and a, a zone two uh, anastomosis. So with this in mind, how do you, how do I deal with uh, cerebral malperfusion? It's a controversial area in the, in the field of uh, malperfusion type A dissection, but here is my, my algorithm. So if a patient is 
between four to six hours uh, from his event and is a good risk. I think it's an immediate repair, even if the patient is almost co comatose because it's very difficult to assess these patients. They're oftentimes intubated and it's very difficult. If the patient is, is either comorbid or has a, 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 a more than six to eight hours, sometimes I'll prepare if the patient is transferred elsewhere to have a brain CT and to see the brain CT before I bring the patient in the OR or I discuss with the family uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the, the future of the patient that may have some, uh, uh, some neurologic deficits after the operation. If the patient has hemiparesis or plegia, it's about the same uh, algorithm that I use, maybe a bit longer to six to eight hours, uh, immediate repair in patients that are a good risk and probably a more non-operative approach initially if the patient has comorbid or presents uh, 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 late during his, his uh, evolution. Now, if you have a radiological malperfusion, so the patient has an occlusion, let's say of a carotid, but does not have any symptoms, I, I tend to be a bit more aggressive in young patients uh, in, in my hands and consider to do a, a total arch replacement to make sure that these patients don't have arch vessel dissection if it's possible on the long run. And, and in patients that are elderly or comorbid, just do a simple hemi arch or uh, consider in some circumstances doing a, an acerus graph, we'll discuss that. So now we'll go through a, 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 an area, what I call the distal uh, malperfusion. So this is malperfusion distal to the left subclavian. This compromises about 70% of malperfusion during type one dissection. Okay, so this is a, a, a back to our patient with uh, the postpartum patient that has a complete occlusion uh, of the uh, a true lumen in the abdomen. And you see that she has no flow in the SMA. Okay, so this patient had lactates of six when she arrived, and we, dis we were not sure what we were going to do for this patient. Um, and that's why you, in those circumstances, what I do is I do lactates every 30 minutes, every 30 minutes. And I look what happens. If the lactates go up very rapidly, then I'll try to do a very rapid operation. If they probably uh, stay still, I probably will do a, a much uh, a bigger operation or, or make sure that I, I solve the malperfusion. So what are our options in these patients? Most surgeons will do a classic hemi arch, and I think it's a very good operation, but you have to take this in mind. It's, it, it, the, it's the risk of mal, a persistent malperfusion if you do a simple hemi arch. Remember what we said. If you have a malperfusion like this, very severe malperfusion, it's because you have a big primary intimal tear, almost no re-entries. So if you still have a primary intimal tear at the level of the anastomosis because you have a distal new entry tear, you're at risk to have ongoing malperfusion in the post-operative course. So I always say, try to keep the patient alive, but if you don't deal with malperfusion in, in such a case, the patient won't be alive. So you have to make sure that you take care of the malperfusion and what are your tools to assist this? Well, interoperative TE is important. It's a tool you have, use it. Okay, so the, once you reperfuse following your distal anastomosis, look at your true lumen. Did it expand? Did it stay small? Those are, 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 are important things to assess. Other tools that you have is a distal pulse. If you didn't have any pulse, you have a pulse now, it's probably good. The trend in lactates is very important. And if you're in a hybrid room, even you can shoot an angio at the end. And if you have doubts, an early CT will help you out because you can salvage these patients sometimes with endovascular procedures. For distal malperfusion is to use the Osiris graph. What's the Osiris graph? Well, it's basically a graph that has a nitinol stents, uncovered stents, so it's just nitinol, and has a, a Teflon felt for a, the uh, anastomosis in the ascending aorta. So these patients have a classic hemi arch that we just described, and we insert this graph in the true lumen uh, to expand the true lumen and to try to, to, to remodel the false lumen. So what do the studies say? <clears throat> so it increases for sure true lumen perfusion, 
Okay, it decreases the risk of DAIN. Okay, DAIN is, as I just discussed, is distal new entry tear at the distal anastomosis. So it's a new primary intimal tear. If you just do a, a simple hemiarch, you can have that happen probably in 50 to 60% of patients with a simple hemiarch. And here with, uh, with DAIN, with a, an Osiris graph, it probably decreases 10%. I don't know, but it's in, the, in this vicinity. It increases thrombosis of the false lumen compared to hemiarch, but however, it has no impact on aortic growth uh, at long term. Okay, but on the downside is if you have to do redo operation in these cases, they are very difficult redo cases. So, what's my personal approach for the use of the Osiris? Well, there are prerequisites for its use. Its use you have to resect the primary intimal tear in a malperfusion case. Okay, it's, it's a sine qua non. There has to be no significant uh, arch or proximal descending re-entry because you'll have still a perfusion of the false lumen and, and still malperfusion. And ideally, no arch vessel dissection. If you have this, the Osiris graphs usually have good outcomes. So my personal indication is in severe distal dynamic malperfusion requiring immediate operation. So there's no delayed approach possible that we will discuss. Like if you have a patient with tamponade or cerebral malperfusion that's concomitant, these are the type of cases I will use the Osiris graph. I do not use the Osiris graph to enhance a distal remodeling after a type A dissection. The other option when you have a distal malperfusion is to use frozen elephant trunk grafts. Okay, here you have what we have on the market. The Torflex is, as you know, uh, uh, commercialized here in Canada. The Evita and the Cook graph that I've worked on are, are on special access. So for those that are not to use with this graph, it's basically a, an Osiris graph that we dis described, but you do a total arch replacement, but the graft is covered. So it truly really blocks all re-entries or natural fenestration in the proximal descending aorta. And you cannot have a better procedure to reperfuse the true lumen and to remodel the, uh, uh, the descending aorta. So this graph are to decrease back bleeding from the false lumen. So you have a secure distal anastomosis. It expands the true lumens, like I said, and it's the best operation to decrease dynamic malperfusion. And it seals complex tear in the proximal or a descending or in the arch. If you have a large arch tear in a dissection, putting in a FEP is really eases the procedure. It's, it's, it's much easier operation. And also it, to mid to long-term, we hope that it will enhance uh, aortic remodeling, possibly decrease late aneurysmal formation and also improve long-term survival. These are hypotheses that the Head Start study that's pioneered by Munir and Morale, and I had to congratulate Munir for his role into this, it, it will assess uh, in the uh, upcoming uh, years. So, What's the downside though of the FET procedure? Well, it requires a total arch replacement and it's, it's not an easy operation, especially regarding the LSA revascularization, which can be quite difficult, especially in a dissection and especially if the, the subclavian is dissected. So what's the impact on the operative mortality? Well, in good hands, it's probably not it increases not too much the, uh, in, uh, the, oper the operative mortality, but however, in patients with severe comorbidity or very sick patients, it for sure increases mortality. One uh, morbidity that we have to make sure or that is, is linked to the FET procedure is the risk of paraplegia, which is around three to 4%, and it's a dramatic complication. So this is a, a so what? How do we deal now? So so to better deal with the left subclavian, we've started in our institution to start stenting the left subclavian during FET procedure. So this is the example of uh, how this is done. There's a guide wire. This there's a, a, a hole that was done uh, in the the uh, the FET the cook FET device. The art here is open. You can see here that there was a guide wire in, pushed in, in the left subclavian. This is a B graph, but I use a Vioban now. And, and the, uh, the stent is, is about with one centimeter in the, uh, 
the lumen of the aorta and, and is inflated to the size of the uh, left subclavian. <clears throat> and following that, the, the stent is flared uh, approximately. So this, uh, this uh, allows for an easy revascularization of the left subclavian. We've done <clears throat> approximately 30 uh, patients in this uh, physician modified graft uh, 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 template. Uh, and you can see here, back the graft and we see the, the stent. So this is the kind of configuration you get uh, in, in these uh, these kinds of procedures. So it really eases out uh, uh, the procedure. Now, this is an example of a case with an arch tear. You can see the uh, arch tear uh, in this patient. Patient is doing pretty good, is in overall stable condition. And this patient was treated with the FET uh, uh, and, uh, and the stent in the left, left subclavian. You can see here the stent in the left subclavian. And you have very nice remodeling of the descending aorta with the FET procedure. You see the fluttering of the septum that was talking there. Uh, and, and this patient uh, uh, did not uh, die dilate his, his proximal descending at follow-up. But there's always a but, there's always problem, problems. And, and this is one problem of a physician-modified graft. Like I said, we did over 25 to 30 patients, but we come back again to our postpartum patient. And, and when you do a physician-modified graft, things can happen. And during I was, when I was doing this, this uh, patient, uh, I, I decided finally to do a, a FET procedure because the lactates were stable. Uh, I, 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 somebody hit the cautery when I was doing my hole and, and, and basically I, I did a pretty larger uh, opening in the graft and I've, I've had this, uh, this leak. And it's not a big leak, but when you look at the CT, it's very interesting. I was telling you, if you have a Dane, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's problematic, but if you can look here in this patient, once again, if I can just show again, is that at the distal descending, you see that the, the true lumen is still very small. She was not necessarily uh, uh, acidotic again, but the, 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 it just shows that, you know, it doesn't take very much to keep the, this false lumen pressurized. So uh, the problem, the, the bailout of this operation is to do a, a carotid left subclavian and, and to, uh, to do a, a relining of the T-var. So this is what was done in, in this patient. Uh, uh, so relining and, and after that, nice remodeling and uh, opening of the uh, true lumen uh, thereafter. So, so that just shows that if you do a physician modified graft, it's not ideal. And that's why we designed a, a new graft that uh, is, uh, has these configurations. So it's a, a, a much uh, a easier device to deploy because it has a handle. Uh, it's uh, uh, also a graph that uh, has a nose cone that is also easy to, to, uh, to uh, take back. And the prosthesis is collapsed for the two first stents. So this uh, prosthesis can be easily moved within the aorta to align the fenestration that's within the graft. Okay, so the fenestration here, you align the fenestration uh, to the left subclavian, and then you have uh, the fenestration that's already, already designed and eases uh, the uh, left subclavian uh, stenting. So two weeks ago, we performed the first case uh, of this during a, a type A dissection. This is a patient that you, you, you can see has a um, severe distal malperfusion. And in fact, uh, you, when you, you see this, he has no true lumen in the abdomen, he, no lightening of the celiac mesenteric and the two kidneys uh, are still almost black. So this patient was and pretty much interestingly had did not have uh, elevated lactates where I think they were at 3.5, but he was very close to his event. And that's when I say better jump on this patient fast because he's gonna have some problems if you don't act faster for this patient. So this patient was treated with the graph that I, I just discussed with the uh, uh, in situ uh, uh, fenestration and, and the stent in the left subclavian and this patient uh, uh, did very well postoperatively. So this, this is the, the, the new generation that I would say graph that we, we plan to use in, in the upcoming cases and the Head Start trial in, in our institution. So now we're at the distal limb uh, perfusion. Uh, uh, and this case shows once again, a dyna dynamic, um, the, um, mm. 
like a non-A, non-B dissection. So it almost starts in the left carotid, okay? And in this case, there are different possibilities. But the, the way this, this case was dealt with is what I call the Munir operation, because Munir was the first to, to ask me, well, you, we could just maybe transect the arch and put your graft in and sew back the arch together. So that's what we did here in this case, thinking about Munir, and we just transected, we translocated the left carotid, put in the frozen elephant trunk, and uh, put in the uh, close back the uh, the mid arch, uh, including the the frozen left and trunk or the cook graft, and the patient uh, uh, evolved well in his malperfusion of the left leg and and has a stable uh, descending aorta. A a quick uh, uh, thought about paraplegia: it's very rare. Okay, the assessment can be difficult. Uh, recovery of complete paraplegia. If a patient is completely paraplegic when he arrives following a dissection is anecdotal. It's been reported, but uh, I think it's very rare. So what should you consider? If there's a dynamic malperfusion, I would consider an Osiris graft in these patients. I would try to put a lumbar drain if it's possible, and I would pray, okay? Uh, because it's, you never know what's going to happen, but most of these patients are going to stay paraplegic, especially if you're a few hours out. This is one of my first TVARs, when I arrived in, in 2000, this elderly patient arrived with a 5.1 of INR with a massive left hemothorax, and she was uh, uh, paraplegic. And we did the uh, TVARs that we had off the shelf. So it was like a hectic, hectic operation at that time. And uh, this patient left, uh, she was uh, 78 and left uh, walking with a cane. So it was a, it's a, an anecdotal case. Then. So we arrived at a very controversial aspect in such patients with mild perfusion. Is there a subset of patients we should not treat in an open way initially and treat maybe endovascularly? And this is the Michigan approach. And the prerequisites to do that, it depends of your institution. You have to know what are your, your, your capabilities of your institution, okay? So you have to have a multidisciplinary team that's rapidly available. And that's something that's not necessarily always possible. And you have to put that against, you know, how if you do an open operation, you reperfuse rapidly the true lumen, probably you're better off to do that than do a quick, quick operation, hemiarch or put in a cyrus graft, okay? You have to have an absence of tamponade or hemodynamic instability or and an absence of cerebral malperfusion. But even if you look in the Michigan series, some patients are going to develop this during the interim before their open operation. So you're going to have a certain amount of patients that are going to die because of aortic rupture because you didn't intervene fast. Okay? And you have to have also severe organ malperfusion, especially mostly mesenteric. But it's an, it's an important aspect to, to, to remember, especially in patients that I discussed, if you have a post type A repair, let's say you do a, a hemi arch, you have persistent distal malperfusion. Those are the cases sometimes where you can do endovascular measures to uh, salvage uh, it, it, persistent malperfusion. Some patients with non, non A, non B uh, dissection, uh, elderly uh, comorbid patients, uh, and good risk patients with severe mesenteric ischemia. I'll discuss maybe a few cases. This is a case of uh, operated by one of my colleagues, IMH. You know, we look at IMH, sometimes oh, it's just an IMH. Just an IMH can be a very difficult operation, okay? And especially for the distal anastomosis, I'm much more aggressive now to put the FET, uh, to put the frozen elephant trunks in these procedures because it really stabilizes the distal anastomosis. So he had an, an operation and, and, and it was a difficult operation. And this is where I get involved. So the patient has a, a abdominal pain uh, and he has a, an abdominal C and you can see that here he has a severe uh, distal malperfusion and the guy has like 14 of lactates okay he's not doing very well okay so <clears throat> at that point we did a salvage therapy by just putting in a dissection stents uh, along the uh, the descending aorta and you can see here that the uh, true lumen opens I like better putting dissection stents than putting in true uh, T vars because I think it it, it more it, al it allows you can have aortic rupture or, or, or collapse with a true T var I try that you can put a T var as a second uh, stage if you still have the malperfusion so it up open up enough the um, 
the true lumen to allow that the patient to have to recuperate and to be discharged. But once again, these patients have to be followed. But this guy was living in a in a little cabin in the woods, and he came back a, a few year, a few years later, and he came back with this. Okay, and and so you see, I believe you look at this. So he comes back with a huge aneurysm. With uh, you see the and he lost the uh, the right kidney, probably owing to a static malperfusion that we didn't recognize. Uh, uh, so he has a very complex disease, and this patient was uh, was treated with a cleanup operation with initial carotid lift subclavian bypass, a bental total arch, and, and a frozen elephant trunk, and he had a, a pretty decent uh, uh, result uh, with his dissection stents that were still there, and we're trying to follow this patient, uh, uh, it, which is not necessarily an easy task. Okay. So let's switch a bit to type B dissection with distal malperfusion. What you have to remember in these patients is if you have a malperfusion in type Bs, you have to cover the primary tendinal tear. That's, that's the, your goal that you have to set is try to cover that uh, primary intimal tear and look what happens thereafter, okay? So this is a patient that has a complex type B dissection with a big, big primary intimal tear and you have almost distal malperfusion. So in these cases, what, we, what the literature says and what you should do, I think, is to, to have the petticoat technique to make sure you open up as much as possible <clears throat> the two lumen, okay? So you do a first covered graft followed by dissection stent. This really opens up the true lumen and probably uh, decreases the risk of having septal injuries with your uh, covered stent. Okay, so this patient uh, underwent a petticoat technique, had a good remodeling of the descending aorta, good opening of the true lumen uh, and evolved well thereafter. Now this, I'll take just a bit of time to discuss this patient. This is a patient I had about a month ago, okay? And there was this little uh, GP physician in, in the Gaspésie near Percy <laughs> and that calls me and, and says, you know, I, I have this patient here. He has really, you know, back pain, sudden back pain and something, it just doesn't sound good, okay? I did a CT and, um, and the radiologist says there's no pulmonary emboli because the guy had uh, past history of thrombophlebitis. He has no em pulmonary emboli and she just says that the aorta has a 4.1 centimeter descending aneurysm. It was 2 a.m. in the morning and I, for the residents, never, never accept things for granted. So what I said, okay, I want to see that CT. So I had to call the guy from the back sphere and to push the CT in our, and it was 2 a.m. in the morning, okay? So I said, no, and, and, and even if it's your attending, go see the CT, don't take anything for granted. That's the lesson you have to learn. So I pushed the CT in, and even if the radiologists, they, they, they sometimes, or a lot of times, they don't have the right uh, imaging or right response, and just these little displacement of calcification, okay? You see that, and, and when we run the CT, you probably won't see them, okay? But when you look at it, this is, this is pathognomonica of, of either an intramural hematoma or a dissection. And you see the, this quality of the CT, you cannot say anything. So, so this patient was brought to our institution and another CT was performed. And once you see it's, it's a big intermal tear at the level of the left subclavian, very close to the left subclavian, and you have no perfusion of the left kidney. Okay. Most of the time, that's going to be a static. There's been a component of a, a static malperfusion in, in, that, in that kidney. And, and what I decided to do there, I was not, I was, the intimal, the intimal tear was very fresh in the arch, and I was very not keen to, to do a, a T-bar early because of the risk of retrograde type A. So uh, I decided to send the patient to do a, 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 a renal stenting. And, and at that point, the, 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 they did a renal stent and, and he had a pretty good outcome. Okay, so the, 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 the kidney uh, got, had a, 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 a better uh, perfusion, but it was not necessarily still optimal. And the evolution of this patient was quite interesting. We kept the patient in for 10, 14 days and he was very hypertensive. He had IV drips and he had seven PO med meds uh, to, to deal with his high blood pressure. 
Okay, so I think after that, what I said, well, you know, I think we're going to have to deal with his, his proximal tear. And I decided to, to try to treat it in a more stable configuration with a septum that was probably more stable about two weeks thereafter and, and did a, 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 a TVAR and had a, a, a good uh, outcome. And the patient is much more easy to control on his blood pressure. So a lot of lessons, the patients are going to teach you a lot if you take time to understand, to question question them and to understand the, the pathology and to look at the CT. So this is my last case that I have to present to you. Is, 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 is it different if we have a patient with an erythropathy? Okay, so for type one dissection, it's the same management strategy. Okay, uh, for type B dissection, um, it can be different. Uh, uh, I think we have to deal it very in, in, in a different way. This is a Lois Dietz syndrome patient. This is his CT of the descending aorta, which is normal about three months before his, his, uh, his type B dissection. And, and so the, the patient comes with a, a, a type B dissection, okay, with a, a very small true lumen, it's a radiological malperfusion, but the patient is doing, uh, is pretty stable hemodynamically with normal lactates. So I, that was a few years ago, okay? And, and uh, I, I decided, you know what, to, to do this patient open, okay? And, and not to put in a T-bar because I, I like to have proximal Dacron in these cases. So I did the patient open and, and basically the operation went, uh, quite well, okay, and they, uh, I revascularized the left subclavian, but we see still here distal uh, 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 dissection, and this is owing to, to probably also a, a Dane in the distal anastomosis, but uh, we were pretty glad of the, of, the, um, of the outcome, and the patient was discharged back and went back to, to Saguenay, and, uh, and uh, three weeks later, I get a call that, that the patient spent uh, overnight in the Shigutimi hospital because he had uh, abdominal pain and they didn't know too much and they did the CT just in the morning, okay? So th this is his CT, okay? So he has air in the portal circulation, okay? He has thumb printing in the abdomen, Okay, uh, uh, so he's uh, like lactates are 14. Okay, this patient is just dying. Okay, so, and this is where the, the, the issue of, of doing endovascular procedure comes, comes into play. So this patient had dissection stents in the true lumen, had section was very, 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 very sick. But he recuperated from all this. Probably four months in the hospital, come back, come back a, a, a few months later. And, and thereafter, you have, when I, if you decide to do endovascular procedures in these patients with r you have to it's, it's like a bridge to a, a final repair. So this patient, I put in a, a, another, another T-VAR to bring the, the, the repair down to the hiatus and do an open thoracic abdominal after that for a, like a type four repair. And, and this patient now has a, a full jacket of either endoprosthesis or, or, or Dacron graft for his full aorta. He still has an endo leak at that. At, uh, is, no, that's not the, sorry about that. He has a, a, a brother that has also a Lois D syndrome and he has a normal descending aorta and he wants me to do his thoracic abdominal now, which I think is a, is a bit difficult, but it, it, that's a problem. So I, I would just like to conclude saying that the malperfusion syndrome during acute dissection is a complex disease, I, I, I think that, that I just illustrated, that requires an expert multidisciplinary team. Uh, and it requires meticulous uh, uh, imaging analysis. Uh, it's, uh, the, you have to know what are your tool sets uh, uh, of open and endovascular skills. It requires a collaborative effort among 
all physicians, preoperative, interoperative, postoperative, uh, and expert uh, 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 field to take care of these patients. And, and furthermore, understanding the pathophysiology is very important uh, to have a comprehensive treatment of these patients and to tame the disease. So thank you very much. And I don't know if there's any questions uh, from the, either the audience or, or people who are on Zoom. Thanks, Francois. That was a, a great talk. Just as a side note, uh, when he's referring to radiologists missing uh, obvious diagnosis, there any not any of them was from the Ottawa region. <laughs> uh, I hope Francois, uh, all these patients does not come in the, the, the same week. Um, I think we have questions. Maybe in the chat. A fantastic talk. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a niche topic uh, because type A dissections are a rare problem, but then within that, managing complex malperfusion is, is even, even uh, more rare, uh, but obviously very important for patients. So it, I love the way you've kind of broken down systematically, uh, you know, all the different levels of malperfusion and, and the algorithms uh, that you can use uh, to treat them. So fantastic talk. Thank you for that. Um, my question is, you know, um, uh, maybe a big picture question about where a surgery for type A dissection is going. Um, when we, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, when we used to think of type A dissections, the, the, the real goal was get the patient out alive. And people would do the minimum possible, do femoral artery cannulation, uh, ascending gear replacement and get out. Because the idea was that the less you do, the more uh, you're likely to have a survivable outcome. And you could try to do complex things in dissections you know, you're gonna, there's gonna be an issue. I think now we've evolved to, to doing other techniques. We have new devices available that allow us to do total arch, FETs, et cetera. Uh, my question is, uh, where do you think we stop? So if you have a patient uh, who you salvage after type A dissection, let's say you do a uh, FET, um, what, uh, how far down the aorta do we want to go? Because you know that their downstream consequences are going to be distal dilatation, even if they have the fat in place. Do you routinely, for example, bring your uh, fat patients back three months later to cover more aorta downstream? Do you go down to celiac to enable that full descending thoracic aorta remodeling? Or do you leave it? Because I have this question in my mind, because there's a number of patients who have a successful type A dissection repair. Uh, but then are left with, you know, a pancake false uh, true lumen in the mid descending. When when is the right time to intervene for for that population? Yeah, well, good questions, Munir. Um, I think you know maybe to 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 allude to your first comment uh, regarding we're now more aggressive. I think we're more aggressive. It's like you know outcomes in cardiac surgery have have just uh, uh, been better during the last two decades because of of many things. We're we're better surgeons. We're specialized in in different areas. We have more uh, better anesthesiology, better perioperative care, better, better uh, ICU care, and, and I think this allows us to do more complex operation electively and also you know during uh, during uh, acute situations so i think yes we're going to be more aggressive i think what we have to know is to it, which patients are going to benefit from that? And I think your study is going to, going to help a lot on that. Uh, I think we have some, some areas. We know that patients that have still a, tr a true lumen that very small after a hemiarch replacement in the descending aorta are probably going to dilate their, their proximal descending down the road. So those are the patients that if they have a really small true lumen preoperatively, uh, on their CT and that they come with a type one dissection and that they're young, I'm very aggressive doing a FET procedure in, the, in these patients. Now, regarding the distal ex ex extent, for sure, you know, as you agree, we, the worst thing we want is to, to ca cause harm to the patient. Uh, if we have a patient that's paraplegic after we do a FET for, for distal remodeling, it's difficult to justify. So, so for sure, we're gonna have only a 10 centimeter graft. 
So for sure, there can be some issues of not having optimal distal remodeling in the descending aorta. If you have a distal reentry, you're going to have still that patent. So those are things I look that if I have a reentry that keeps the false lumen open in the thorax, then I'll probably uh, add something. If I have a good remodeling just with the stent, I, I won't do anything further. But that's where I look into it. Let's say if I have a reentry, yes, I would probably add a, a T-VAR down the road, probably at least three months after. Hi, Francois. Great talk. Uh, Sir Nyko from Vascular. Um, question I have is on a practical level, when we uh, often collaborate with our uh, cardiac surgery uh, colleagues, if they have a type A and someone has a mesenteric ischemia, renal ischemia, legs gone down, not totally ischemic, but obviously uh, um, uh, the circulation is compromised. What do you do first? And that's a question that often goes back and forth, especially if it's bowel and, and there's obviously there's some ischemia. Um, and there's always a, you know, the discussion, should you do something about the bowel? Should you do something about the, uh, uh, the, the type A first, which is gonna fix the bowel? So that, that's part of it. The other thing is with your FET being a special access, the ability to, uh, to do that on an emergency basis and then sew to that, which can perhaps solve everything at one time, that's not there yet, is that correct? If it's special access or can this be on the shelf and do you have to measure it or does, does it not matter? It may not matter because you're sewing to it. So my question is, is, is this actually, um, doing a T-VAR first and doing a reverse frozen elephant trunk and you sewing to the T-VAR forgetting the FET for a second. Is that something you do with these patients with a rising lactate and you're not sure what you need to do first to get them off the table? Yeah, well, I, I think those are very good questions. And you know, I, when you want to do a, a, an endovascular first approach, First, you really have to make sure that the patient is stable hemodynamically, has no cerebral malperfusion, and that you have a, a, ready, a ready team you know, to deal with this. And, and the problem sometimes, as you just said, is that you know, we, we go back and forth and we, we want to we don't know what's best for the patient. And that's a problem because sometimes there are delay in treatment and, and, and probably you should choose a, a treatment quite fast and, and the, the surgeon should have that. And that's why in these patients, I do, very, I do serial lactates. And, and if I see the lactates right, or they're very high initially, or they're rising, then I will take the decision uh, depending on, on, on what I have also on the clinical exam. If I have a patient like you, like I saw that I know has air in the, you know, or in, in the liver and has some printing on the, on, on the bowel, then probably I will go for, for something endovascular. But if the patient has non-rising lactates or, or, or uh, okay, and the patient is stable hemodynamically, if you can reperfuse the true lumen fast in an open operation in my institution where I don't even have endoradiology, I don't even have vascular surgery in my institution, I'm much better to do that and probably I would do an Osiris graft then. Doing a, a reverse, let's say a, a T-VAR and sewing to the T-VAR, that's a bit the Roselli approach, I think can be a, an interesting option. But if I really have to do something fast, I would probably go for an Osiris graft to really open up the true lumen as much as I can with a fast operation with the hemi arch and with not as much risk of pain. That's those in those circumstances that's where I would use the Osiris graft. What up? How about Munia? Would you, you agree with that? I would say uh, the the, the trade-off, of course, is like what is what is happening proximally. You know, is there AI? Is there coronary malperfusion? Is there uh, pericardial effusion? And those things are very unpredictable. So I think any delay. Uh, I think um, can kind of compromise that. Um, I would say a, a, an open operation with ASIRIS in that context is probably okay. Although I must say we haven't tried this approach and it, it, there may be a very small subset um, in whom that